So uh, we were talking about numerical methods now for continuous optimal transport and thinking about the motion pair equation in, in general. Uh, so last class, uh, I argued that what we want is to be able to build schemes that are, of course, consistent with the P and stable, but also monotone in particular. And then we can start to prove things about convergence to weak solutions. <coughs> so there's a couple different ways of um, building monotone schemes for the motion pair equation. I'm going to talk about the one that is the, the simplest, the simplest to probably describe and to implement. <coughs> uh, so we gave a couple examples last time of some operators or some approximations that are monotone or are not monotone. Uh, in particular, we said the discretizations we write down of our mixed derivative and the uxy term are not monotone. That's not an elliptic operator, um, which means we have to try to be a little bit clever in the way we write our motion pair equation to be able to discretize it properly. <coughs> uh, so one thing that we said is, well, if we happen to have a direction that's grid aligned, for example, something like this, then we can do center differences. Right? You, you, you need to use more than just nearest neighbors. You have to look a little farther away. Uh, but then you could say something like the second derivative in this direction is, uh, and now you just do. Uh, Completely normal, completely normal center difference discretization, uh, but instead of just going i plus one, i minus one, you're going out in some different direction. Okay, over five h squared. <coughs> okay, and these these second directional derivatives are going to actually hold the key for how we can discretize the motion pair equation itself. So what do we need to do? We need to adjust a little bit our idea, our usual idea of consistency. So this is the idea. Say we're given a grid, say a finite difference grid, okay, with uh, spacing H. And we're going to make use of this idea that maybe we don't just want to look at nearest neighbors. Maybe we're willing to look a little farther away. Here we went two grid points out. Um, so I'm going to define how far out I'm willing to look. I'm going to call that W. So let's define a maximal stencil width W. That means I'm willing to look that far away. And now I'm given just some direction mu, so which may or may not be good aligned. Okay, so let's see if we can draw this. We'll draw a little grid here. Nu is pointing out in this direction somewhere, positive x, positive y direction. Uh, and let's just in this example say that w is equal to 3. Okay? So the distance between grid points is h. My maximum stencil width is equal to 3. And say this is my reference point. <coughs> now I'm going to say which directions can I resolve, can I resolve um, if I'm going to look up to 3 grid points away? Well, I can obviously do that one. That's a standard one. Uh, I could go out three grid points in this direction and one up. I could go, let's see, I could go two and one. I could do one and one. Okay, I could, you know, I could go out to here or to here too, and that would be the same directions that I already have. Uh, and you know, we can keep going with this. Let's see, what else do we have? We could have 2 and 3. Where's 2 and 3? Something like this. That's 2 and 2. Let's try 
by 2 and 3. You know, I can do all sorts of different things like this. Uh, I could do 3 and 2. That will get me to here. Okay, and so on. And obviously this one. Okay, so these are directions that are grid aligned if I'm willing to look up to three grid points away. And I say, well, let's see, where is mu? Say the direction I actually care about is none of these. Uh, maybe the direction I actually care about is something like this. <clears throat> so here is the key that's going to let us do things that are monotone and, and still hopefully consistent in some sense. I'm going to say I'm not going to approximate you know exactly. I'm going to pick a different direction, a nearby direction, and approximate that uh, using a normal scheme. Okay, so what am I doing? I have my usual grid resolution over here, but now I'm going to also say we're a little off on the angle. We're not quite hitting the direction. Okay, so if I uh, zoom this over here, this was the direction that I cared about, I knew. I had this direction on the grid, and I had this direction on the grid. <coughs> okay, so I'll call this new one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. New six, new five. This is my new. <coughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the direction that lines up as well as possible with this. So say new six is the closest I can get in terms of direction, in terms of making this angle as small as possible. And I'm going to use a center difference scheme for the wrong direction. But not, not totally wrong, it's a nearby direction. Okay, so we use a center difference scheme. for a nearby direction. <coughs> and they say new six in this case. So what is my scheme going to look like? Now my approximation is going to look like, okay, I go out in a direction of h times not new, but a nearby new. Okay, so it's still a usual center difference discretization. And then scaled appropriately to make sure it's consistent. <coughs> okay, so what's happening? There's now two sources of error. There's a usual source of error. The usual source of error says how far away am I looking, right? H. Or in this case, I might be looking at distance wh away. But now there's this extra source of error, this angle that I'm, I'm not quite resolving right. So I have here two sources of discretization error. Okay, so I have the usual spatial resolution. I have now this angular resolution, d theta. Okay, and what happens? As I take w to be bigger and bigger, as I'm willing to look farther and farther away, I'm able to pick up more and more directions. My d theta is going to get smaller. Um, but there's, there's a trade-off. As w gets farther away, you know, the distance from here to here gets larger and larger. And that's going to increase my effective spatial resolution error. So there's, there's two things at play here. Overall, we're going to have discretization error. It's going to be on the order of, uh, well, this is a second order accurate scheme uh, if we were approximating uh, new six. Okay, so that's second order in, in this distance, which is like W H. So W squared H squared. And then we're not quite getting the right direction, so there's going to be this d theta error. <clears throat> okay, and again, 
the d theta error is going to depend on how far away I'm looking, right? The wider I'm out, I'm willing to go. The more angles I resolve, the smaller d theta is. So we could put d theta in terms of the width. It's going to look like 1 over w. Are there any questions on this so far? Now, what has to happen for a consistent scheme? As h goes to 0, what happens? Yeah, it should converge. So in other words, as h goes to 0, we want the discretization error to go to 0. Right? right now, as h goes to 0, the discretization error doesn't go to 0. Right? We've got this fixed 1 over w term, because I'm never resolving this angle any better. Um, so what's the solution to that? How do we force that the error to go to zero? Go along the angle. What do you mean go along the angle? The angle zero. And I need, um, that's what I need to do. Yeah. So how do I make the angle go to zero? You want to rotate? We are going to rotate at some point. So one way to do that is to say, I'm not just going to stick with w equals 3 all the way through. As I take h smaller, I'm going to also let w get bigger. All right? So I need both, I need both terms in this discretization error to go to 0. Right? That means I certainly need this term to go to 0, the h to go to 0. But I also need this term to go to 0. I need w to go to infinity at the same time. <coughs> so what we're going to do is actually, let's try to let w be a function of h itself. <coughs> right, so that means on a coarse grid, I might be willing to look two grid points out. On a very fine grid, maybe I have to look 10 grid points out. Right? And as I refine the grid, I have to take wider and wider extensions. Okay, and we need to do it carefully. We need to do it in a way that wh goes to 0 and 1 over w goes to 0, right, as h goes to 0. And there's plenty of ways to do that. Right? So for example, I might say my stencil width is going to look like, say, 1 over root h. Okay. Or I'll stick with that. Right? So then my discretization error is going to be on the order of, well, 1 over root h squared, 1 over h times h squared, so h squared plus root h, which scales like root h. You could actually do better than that in this particular case. Okay, and this indeed goes to 0 as h goes to 0. Okay, so we have consistency, but in order to get consistency, we had to build more complicated schemes. Uh, and again, this is a theorem that actually you're stuck with this. the uh, domain. Yeah, this is an important question. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but I'll answer it a little bit. So let's say we're over here, and we want this point, but it's outside the domain. Um, so what people used to do in this case, and we just, what, what, actually what people usually do in this case is cheat and, and not talk about it. And we'll just say, eh, I'll just use an inconsistent scheme here, or I'll use a non monotone scheme here. But you don't have to cheat. You can actually do this right. The way to do it right is to say, I need more points on the boundary. So not only do I need the corners of these squares, I need some extra points on the boundary. 
and I can build a discretization scheme that uses this point. It won't be a center difference scheme anymore. Uh, you have to you know, use, some, use Taylor's expansion to derive some other schemes. Um, but you can do this as long as you have extra points along the boundary. It doesn't have to line up with this direction. You know, it might be the case that this is the direction. Uh, as long as I have kind of enough extra points along the boundary and you can quantify what enough is, you can always take this guy and this guy and use them in place of, in place of this guy over here. So yeah, it's an important question. And again, getting the consistency in monotonicity can be done. It's always at the expense of more complicated schemes, but you know, that's what you're stuck with when you're trying to solve fully nonlinear equations. Okay, so we've got a consistent scheme for second directional derivatives. Okay, these are these are still these are still uh, you know linear operators, which we ultimately if there's this much trouble even just doing linear elliptic operators. But it turns out once you can do linear elliptic operators properly, it's not so hard to build schemes for fully nonlinear operators. These really are the building blocks. So how do we do Mojet pair? <coughs> so we need to use this for Mojet pair. <coughs> so let's remember this. U nu nu is the second directional derivative. Uh, it depends on uh, the hashing of U, obviously. It depends on second derivatives. And it depends on second derivatives in this way. <coughs> okay, and I can do this for all sorts of different directions. Now, in particular, suppose that nu is not any direction, but it is actually an eigenvector direction for my Hessian vector. Well, now what do I have? Okay, I have this again. But now I can simplify things a little bit, right? Nu is an eigenvector. So matrix times my eigenvector is the same as eigenvalue times my eigenvector. So this is going to be the same as lambda nu transpose nu, which is simply the eigenvalue if nu happens to be equal to factor. <clears throat> All right, eigenvalues are useful. Motion pair operator, right, is the determinant of the Hessian. The determinant is nothing but the product of the eigenvalues. So now all of a sudden we can rewrite this motion pair operator as, okay, it's the product of these eigenvalues. And each of these eigenvalues can be characterized as a second directional derivative, where the direction is given to by the corresponding eigenvector. So this is nothing but the product of these second directional derivatives, where the new j are eigenvectors. of this Hessian matrix. And that's great, because these are terms I know how to approximate in an appropriate way. You know, it's a more complicated way, but it's consistent and logical. It fits within all the convergence theory that we wrote down last time. <coughs> I guess the remaining challenge is, what are these directions actually? In practice, I need to actually be able to figure out what these things are. So now, th now is where we get to start rotating things. Do you want to just do because you've heard this talk? Let's 
I'll do this in 2D, but this all works in higher dimensions. Let's rotate our coordinate frames. In 2D. Okay, so we start here. And what's our operator equal? The usual way we write it is uxx, uyy, minus uxy squared. <coughs> okay, in other words, second derivative along this coordinate direction times second derivative along this coordinate direction, and then minus some other term that involves mixed derivatives, and we don't like mixed derivatives. Okay, we could try other directions. So maybe I decide to come up with another orthogonal coordinate frame. All right, again, in this co these coordinates, I can write down my operator. And it's going to have exactly the same form. Okay? Second derivative along this coordinate direction, second derivative along this coordinate direction, plus or minus actually junk. So we could say, in general, given any orthogonal coordinate system, the determinant of the Hessian, uh, let's say, given my new 1 and new 2, has this form. Uh, on the other hand, we know that the Hessian, the determinant of the Hessian should have this form, right? There should be a way to write it uh, as a product of just the second directional derivatives where somehow all this extra junk should vanish on us. <coughs> I can readily make the observation, what I'm subtracting off of here is positive, certainly, right? It's a squared. So I can certainly say this is always the case. No matter how I rotate my coordinates, this will always be the case, that the product of these uh, directional derivatives overestimates the actual determinant of the Hessian. You want to ask something? It's not true for non-orthogonal. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so we know we're always uh, overestimating if we do this. And we know there's a way to get equality, right? There's a way to get equality if we use the eigenvector direction. Okay, so with equality, if we have eigenvectors, So in other words, this term here <coughs> uh, is, is always too big. This product here is always too big unless we're at exactly the right directions. And then we get equality. So another word, way of saying that is that the determinant of the Hessian is precisely equal to the minimum of all possible products like this. Right? These products are always too big unless we have the right direction. And then we get equality. So this is going to be the minimum of, of these products, where new 1 and new 2 should be orthogonal. Okay, and now, okay, we don't have these uh, 
these mixed terms in here, which is good because we didn't know how to discretize those. We didn't have the things we know how to approximate. Uh, and we have a way to characterize what directions we actually want. We look at all possible orthogonal coordinate frames. We check the value of this operator. We see which one gives us the minimum, and that's the one we want. Okay, and this works in higher dimensions, too. So in, in say, Rn, we get that this is equal to the minimum product of these directional derivatives, uh, where these guys are all orthogonal. take this to the discrete level, uh, there's infinitely many different orthogonal coordinate frames. I, I can't look at all of them, right? So at the discrete level, I'm going to look at finitely many of them, right? I'm going to, this one, this one, this one. I'll keep rotating by amount that's on the order of C minus theta error. So at the discrete level, we might say, Let's look at all possible combinations of orthogonal grid directions. So for example, I might take the direction 1, 2, which lands on the grid, and then I need an orthogonal direction. So I could take, what did I say, 1, 2? So I could take minus 2, 1, and those would all be grid directions uh, with all the new j less than my extensile width. <coughs> okay, so this gives me now a simple simple, it's more complicated than traditional finite differences, but it's still relatively simple to write down. Uh, approximation. Okay, so that the determinant of the Hessian is going to be approximately equal to the minimum over directions that live in my allowed direction set of this product. Okay, all of these terms, right, these are good directions, so all of these I know how to discretize in a consistent and monotone way. Um, do you see any other issues that we should worry about here? So let me rephrase. Each one of these terms is discretized in a monotone way. Does that automatically mean that the product is monotone? For example, uh, let's say, uh, let's just take uxx times uyy, which is approximately, say, ui plus 1j over h squared, and then we do the same thing in the j direction.
Now, let's say I decide to increase the value of this neighbor. Does the value of the operator go up, go down, or stay the same? So the value of this term is certainly going to go up, right? What about the product, though? Does it? Suppose I put my values in here, and this happens to be equal to minus 1. Now I increase the value of this neighbor. This value goes up. Then I multiply it by minus 1. It becomes more negative. It goes down, right? So this is not necessarily monotone. Right. And that was because, because of this problem that this term could have been negative. So what would it mean for this term to be negative? Uh, for others, for one of these second directional derivatives to be negative, what would that mean? The, the operator is not what? The operator is not positive definite, that's right. Which is not what we want. We're at the end of the day looking for convex functions, right? We want the Hessian to be positive definite. That means we want all of these things to be positive. So there's a simple fix here, as we just force them to be positive. So instead, I do this. I say, let's let the determinant be approximately equal to the minimum. OK, of this product. And now, instead of just writing this derivative, I'm going to take maximum of this value with zero. Okay, this is completely consistent with finding convex solutions of the Majin pair equation, because the real thing that we're looking for is convex, and that means this term is positive, and forcing it to be positive changes nothing. Uh, but what this does do is say that at the discrete level, uh, if we're messing around and we accidentally plug something negative into here, we're not going to destroy the monotonicity. All we'll do is say that we don't look at you if you're, if you're negative. We, we cancel you out, and monotonicity is preserved. And consistency will still be preserved, because at the end of the day, the solution we're looking for uh, is going to be convex. So this is indeed monotone. Uh, and this is where, on one of your, maybe your second homework assignment, you played around with uh, embedding a convexity constraint into the PDE. This is where that becomes really important, is that if you, if you just write the operator like this, and you discretize, you don't have monotonicity. If you can build the convexity constraint right into the operator, now you have the opportunity to build something that is monotone, globally monotone. Okay, and this is, as I said, consistent with our constraint. <coughs> Any other questions on that? It's not that hard to write down. It's, it's annoying. It's annoying to code because of actually this problem of eventually you run into boundaries and then you have to do special things. Um, but you know, even that you can do in a systematic way, and it's not that hard to. It's not that hard to implement for some definition of um, not that hard. Yeah. Are oh, the eigenvectors functions of x? Oh, the eigenvectors function of x. Yes, the eigenvectors are functions of x. So the coordinate frame that's active at one point will be different than the coordinate frame that's active at a different point. Absolutely. And you don't know ahead of time which one it's going to be. So yes, you have to, you have to play this game at every point, x. 
And let's do just solving for something really symmetric, x squared plus y squared over 2 or something. So overall, what do we do? Um, we talked about how to do last time about how to do functions of the gradient. That's kind of well understood. All right. So overall, it'd do something like, uh, say, this isn't a negative; it's a bullet point. The uh, GH of grad u. So this function of the gradient, I would do something like like this kind of scheme that we talked about last time, where I plug in center differences. So by D naught, I mean the center difference. OK, and then I say, well, that's not monotone. So I need to include some term that involves uh, the Laplacian, some small multiple of the Laplacian. Okay, I do the same trick that I did over here. If G, G ends up, you know, multiplying my determinant of my Hessian, so I want it to be positive to preserve monotonicity. That's completely fine because this is a approximating a density function, so it should be non-negative. Okay, so this is monotone. Uh, epsilon is taken to be on the order of uh, H times the Lipschitz constant. Okay, and then I could say now my Mojo pair operator uh, at each point h as a function of u is going to look like, okay, minus my approximation to g times my approximation to the determinant of the Hessian plus whatever my density function f is at this point. Right? This operator is monotone and it's constrained to be non negative. This operator is monotone and it's constrained to be non negative. So when we multiply them together, we preserve all of that. Uh, so this is overall going to be consistent in the sense that the error goes to zero as h goes to zero. But we need wider and wider space, and it's going to be monotone. So that's the PDE operator itself. Any more questions on that part? Uh, then the next issue is boundary conditions. Okay, so if I want to do optimal transport, I need this second boundary condition that we talked about where we wrote as this sort of nonlinear Neumann type boundary condition, right? So our boundary condition was of the form h of grad u equals zero. <coughs> okay, and h was a sine distance function or some other defining function to to my target set. Now, if I'm going to use all the convergence here we have, I need a consistent monotone approximation of this boundary condition, too. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it, it's something of this form, uh, you know, some function of the gradient. And in general, we know how to discretize functions of the gradient. Um, but why won't this discretization work for that operator there? You 
looks like you want to say something. You're worried about mass preservation? Well, let's just Let's just do a really dumb example. Here I am sitting at the boundary, and I want to approximate this operator. So what does this scheme say? It says start by just plugging in center differences. And so I say, OK, great, I know that it's center differences. I need to look left. I need to look right. And what happens? There's nothing there. I'm outside the domain. So sort of. Standard schemes, if we're not careful, aren't going to work because they're going to say, let's use information that simply doesn't exist. So anything involving center differences require uh, values that simply don't exist. I use, should I use ghost points? And how will I supply the values of those ghost points? Well, preserving monotonicity of the overall scheme. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the sticky point. You know, a lot of the things that you want to do work well sometimes and fail catastrophically when you get to examples that they don't have smooth solutions or things to generate. <coughs> okay, so what am I going to do? Well, for for this operator, I said it's you know I started by understanding how to do the first order operators. Uh, and then I use those to build up my nonlinear operator. Uh, not first order operators, linear operators, and I use those to build up my nonlinear operator. I'm going to come out do the same thing here and see if I can write this in terms of a bunch of linear operators and then tackle the linear operators. All right, there's a fairly straightforward way to do this as long as we have a convex target set. So this works if y is convex. Um, in practice, if y is not convex, all your regularity theory breaks down. Um, it's not necessarily clear that you have these solutions at all. If y is convex, then the sine distance function is also convex. Now I can start playing games with it. So h of y, we know for convex functions, we can start playing with Legendre transforms. Right? And if I take a Legendre transform and then I take another Legendre transform, I should get back where I started. Okay, and this is going to end up being equal to okay, the supremum of okay, y dotted with some other value minus h star of that other value. And okay, you can check it will be sufficient to look over a unit vector. So what does this turn my boundary condition into? My boundary condition becomes h of grad u, so the supremum of grad u dot n minus h star n. Uh, what is grad u dot n? It's which? It's a directional derivative, right? Uh, so this is a linear term, right? Now we've taken a uh, supremum of a bunch of them, so it's a nonlinear combination, but it's a nonlinear combination of linear terms, and we can try to tackle these linear terms. Okay, h star n uh, is something that you could pre-compute for each value of n, or you know, for finitely many values of n here on a grid. Uh, and h star n 
can check will end up being the supremum. Uh, you only have to look at points actually on the boundary of y at the end of the day of y naught dot n. Um, so there's another interpretation of this in terms of supporting hyperplanes to y. Right, so if y is convex, then, you know, at all these different points, we can find uh, at least one supporting hyperplane, something that just touches it but stays outside. You know, if you have a polyhedral set, then at corners you might have lots of supporting hyperplanes. Um, but you can always do these. And the ends that show up in here, you can interpret as outward normal vectors. Now, any, you give me any n you like, but maybe you say you want n to point in this direction. That means I can find a point where this is the normal to a supporting hyperplane. Okay, so for all n, there exists some, call this y naught and this n, y naught, uh, such that uh, a supporting hyperplane at the point y naught has uh, outward normal n. Okay, that's why I've decided to call this extra uh, variable in here n. I have this interpretation as outward normals. <coughs> uh, and we can interpret a little bit uh, which, uh, which value of n is actually going to be active in this supremum, which, which ends up being important actually. So h of y, we can interpret as uh, the distance to the appropriate supporting hyperplane. <coughs> okay, so which one is it? Suppose this is my y. We know that to get the distance from here to here, right, we want to end up with this being uh, an ortho that's not a very straight line. We want this to be to hit this at a right angle, right? Mm -hmm. So we take y, we project it onto here to some point, why not? There's a particular outward normal at this point. H of y is the distance to this supporting hyperplane. Okay, so this is y minus y naught. Okay, which is the same as y minus y naught dotted with the unit vector in that direction. Okay, that's exactly the form that we have here. N dot y. Here we have an n dot y. And h star was of the form n dot y naught. Here we have a minus n dot y naught. So in other words, when we look at the supremum here, the supremum is going to be attained when n equals n y. Exactly this n y. So the supremum in H is attained for n equal to n y, right? In other words, the normal at this point lies in the same direction as y minus y naught.
So that's a little bit of nice interpretation. We'll maybe use it in a minute. But well, first of all, let's try to uh, discretize this thing. Well, what do I have here? I have my boundary condition is basically a supremum of, of linear advection terms. Yes? Uh, what's, how do you discretize linear advection terms usually? What's, a, what's, a, what's a one way to do it? Upwinding, yeah. That would be a good standard way to do it, and it would be a monotone way to do it. Okay, so for our, our boundary condition, okay, which is, again, a supremum of advection terms, let's try upwinding. So we go back to grad u dot n, and we say, well, we want to either use a forward or backward difference depending on the sign of the normal. Okay, so we need to do n1 dotted with ux. So ux could be, I'll leave a little gap here, it could involve uh, a backward difference. And now what do we want? We want this, this is supposed to be multiplied by n1. We want this to be, I'll put my n1 here. We want this to be non-increasing in the neighbors, right? So if the value of this neighbor uh, goes up, we want the value of the operator to go down. So what should be true of n1 for that to happen? What's that? So you don't have to overthink it too much. So I want, if, if I increase the value of this neighbor, I want the operator to go down. Okay, without the n1 here, that's true of this. Now I want it to still be true when I multiply by n1. It should be positive. So if n1 is positive, I'm gonna do this. If n1 is negative, then I should instead use a forward difference. I would do the same thing for the other components. So max of n2 and 0, and I use a backward difference in, in y. And if it's the min, then I would use a forward difference in y. OK, and so this, this is a standard upwinding scheme. This is monotone and consistent, of course. these linear advection terms and we feed it into here and then uh, are we done? Well, it depends on n. Yes, this is a boundary condition, right? So depending on which way the wind is blowing, depending on where n is lying, I might say, let's use information that came back from back here. Or it might say, let's use the information that came from back here, forward distances. So again, this, OK, we're, we're in a little better shape. This will sometimes work. For some values of n, this will work, right? Whereas before, with center differences, we just have no hope. Uh, this may not work. 
uh, if if the upwind scheme again may request values that are outside the domain. Which it may or may not do depending on what n is. Um, but as it's written right now, we've got to check all values of n, which means at some point it will ask for information that doesn't exist. All right, this is where some of the geometry becomes important. Let's think a little bit uh, about what needs to happen. So we know, you know, this is a piece of premium over all values of n, but at the end of the day, it's going to be attained for a particular value of n, right? And we said it's, it's this one, this n y. So let's think about this a little bit. We have our domain, and we have a point on the boundary. And now we take our gradient map, and we end up on some target set. Okay, the point that was on uh, the boundary over here gets mapped to the boundary over here. <coughs> so wh wh which would you say is more likely? Is it more likely to land here or to land here? First one. The first one. Why? Cyclical monotonicity. You have some sense that we're not supposed to be twisting things around, right? So yeah, your intuition is right there. Now we just have to convince ourselves, you know, exactly where is the cutoff where I can say this would happen and this won't happen. I agree, this should not happen. So let's call this normal NX. It's, this gets mapped over here to some point with normal NY. <coughs> All right, and this is the NY that would show up in the supremum over there. So let's think about these. Now you have some intuition that says somehow NY should not be pointing backwards to NX. That just seems wrong. That seems like it violates the sort of monotonicity we expect here. So let's try to make that precise. call this a little lemma, but actually, given that we have cyclical monotonicity, that our map is the gradient of a convex function, nx and ny should make an acute angle with each other. All right, they're not, they're not going to point in the same direction in general. Things are going to move around a little bit, but we should never get things turning right around. Why does this work? Uh, let's represent these sets as we have been. Okay, we're going to use we're going to use this geometry uh, of of H here. Okay, so we said Y or the boundary of Y can be represented in terms of this uh, distance function. It's the set of all Y where H of Y is equal to zero. And I'm going to do the same kind of thing with x. Now what, how am I going to represent the boundary here? The boundary consists of points that are going to get mapped onto the boundary of y. So we'll do this in a couple of steps. So this is a set of points such that uh, rad u of x lands on the boundary of y. in other words, we should have h of grad u equal to zero. <coughs> okay, so this is sort of a level set representation uh, of, of this boundary, right? We have this function h, and we're saying the boundary is the zero level set of this function. So 
The boundary is the zero level set of this function. Which direction does the gradient of h point? Yeah, so the gradient of h is going to point normal to uh, the boundary. So in other words, uh, normal uh, to the boundary is equal to or parallel to is parallel to the gradient of the defining function. given by the gradient of h. Okay. Um, for, a, for a sine distance function, the gradient has norm 1. So this is a unit vector, in fact. And, and similarly, nx should point in the same direction as the gradient of this function. This is my defining function for x. So nx should point in the same direction as the gradient of h of grad u of x. Okay, so it's equal to the gradient times some constant because it may not be a unit vector anymore. So we do a little bit of chain rule. And what do we get? We get a Hessian of u coming out and we get grad h coming out. in general, we're interested in particular when x gets mapped onto y, right? We want to know how these two normals compare when, when this point here, y was exactly equal to the gradient of u. So if y is exactly equal to the gradient of u, we'll write it this way, this becomes ny. these together and see how far apart they are. Nx uh, dotted with Ny. I'll go the other way. Ny dotted with Nx. Is Ny transpose times uh, a constant times the Hessian times Ny. And what can I say about this? Positive. It's positive, right? Why is it positive? Because the Hessian is. The Hessian is positive, definite, exactly, right? We're focused on convex functions, u. That means this is positive, definite. That means this is always bigger than or equal to 0. So indeed, indeed, we're not going to land over here pointing in the opposite direction. And that means, again, we said in the supremum, this is the value that's going to show up in the supremum. We don't know a priori what it is, but now we know it's certainly not this direction, right? So if I come back to my domain, I'm sitting at a point. This is nx. I don't know which value. Uh, when I discretize, I don't know which value is going to be ny. But I know that ny lives somewhere in this half plane, right? It's not back here. So the possible values 
of NY are now restricted to a half plane. Now, if I go back to my upwinding scheme, say I want to check the direction nx, my upwinding scheme will say, let's use information that came from back here. The wind is blowing this direction, so we want to look at the information back here. Uh, if I was trying to look maybe something not normal, but maybe something like this, my upwinding scheme would say, well, should be looking at information that came from back here. The wind is blowing this direction, so that's where the useful information came from. In particular, as long as we're sitting here making an acute angle with the NX, the upwinding scheme is always going to say, let's look backwards into the domain. So as long as this is true, winning scheme looks backward into the domain. Did we require that x was convex or just y? Uh, to be, x, x has to be convex. So um, if, um, how do I say this? Uh, we're looking for a function u that's convex. Right. And I can't make sense of a function being convex unless it's on a convex domain. Right, so for looking at convex functions, right, I'm looking at the value along lines that connect different points, sure. right? And that line had better stay inside the domain. And the only way it's guaranteed to stay inside the domain is if the domain is convex. Right. Right. Uh, so yeah, the domain has to be convex. Um, th there's tricks you can do there. You, you can say the domain is convex, but my density is zero in part of it that I don't care about. That's right. It's not quite. It's not quite equivalent. Right. Um, the, the, you know, the reason is that I could say, okay, maybe this is what I call my domain, but maybe in here I decide to say let's let f equal zero, and in here I decide to say let's let x equal zero, and here I decide to say let's let f equal one. So you know, I, my mass is actually concentrated in a non-convex set, uh -huh. but for the purpose of the numerics and the analysis, I have to stick it inside of a bigger convex set. Okay. That's it's an important point, actually. Okay, so let's come back to what uh, my scheme is going to be. can represent our boundary condition now as the supremum okay, over n equal 1, but not quite all n, only the ones that make an acute angle with nx of grad u dot n minus h star n. And now, all of a sudden, upwinding is possible. Right Before, upwinding was possible for half the directions that asked for information inside the domain, and it was impossible for the other half. Now we've just ruled out the impossible half. And this, we can upwind. So again, this uh, looks for a supremum over infinitely many directions. Um, we had the same kind of deal in the Molson pair operator where it said, let's look at all possible coordinate frames. We don't use infinitely many directions. So we might say, let's let n h be you know, all directions of the form, cos theta, sine theta, for some discrete set uh, theta. Maybe we go something like this. Okay, 
Okay, so again, we're going to have some angular resolution error. We're not doing all the directions. We're just doing a discrete set of them and making some angular error. But that's going to be on the same order as the angular error we're already making. So it doesn't hurt things too much. And now our boundary condition discretization is going to be of the form okay, supremum over all n in this set. Make an acute angle uh, with our with our, our boundary. Okay, and now along each dimension we upwind. So we say if the jth component is positive, we're going to use a backward difference, and if the jth component is negative. Negative min. We're going to use a positive difference. Minus h star n. Okay, and I'll define this to be my boundary operator. So now we had the whole problem of solving the Mongean pair equation with these second type boundary conditions. Now we've reduced it uh, to the problem of solving this big uh, algebraic nonlinear system. Okay, so abstractly, we had an operator. Uh, of this form at interior points. And we had another nonlinear operator at boundary points. Okay, so we've got one equation corresponding to each unknown. The overall system was designed to be consistent, was designed to be monotone. And now we can actually prove things about this. We can prove that as we solve this system, uh, the solution will actually converge to the weak solution. Right, and it works in practice. We've used this um, for lens design problems, for example, uh, and it actually does what you need it to do. So this is a big nonlinear algebraic system. Now you use your favorite nonlinear solver, um, maybe Newton's method. Actually, with the monotonicity in here, uh, it lets you prove things about the Jacobian of the system. one method for solving the continuous optimal transport problem. Um, there's other methods out there. This is probably one of the only ones that actually has any real convergence theory behind it. Um, and I think I added the paper on the convergence, uh, the full convergence proof onto Canvas. Any questions? Uh, so this, I, what I wrote down here was on a rectangular grid. You're not constrained to be on a rectangular grid. The schemes obviously get more complicated if you're not, um, but you can do this on very general meshes. Um, you just, it all comes down to Taylor expanding. The finite difference methods is all about just Taylor expand everything in sight and then see what pops out. Um, so you can certainly do this on, on other grids and done this on very unstructured grids. I've actually done this on random grids where I say my domain is a circle. To come up with a grid, I just start randomly throwing points into the circle, and this is my grid, and, and this actually works. Um, the schemes are more complicated, of course, but you can do it. So yeah, you can do other grids. Um, you can build in higher order accuracy. 
um, there's tricks for all of these things. Any other questions? If not, I think that's probably it for today. Um, and then probably from here, we're going to start talking about uh, different flows involving opti optimal transport, problems involving flows that involve optimal transport. So fluid flows and gradient flows and things like this. <laughs>